afternoon. I'm Joan Wexler, and I'm the president of Brooklyn Law School. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our 14th Media and Society program. The roster of prominent guests who have spoken at this event in the past have included Reed Hunt, who was then the chairman of the FCC, Russell Lewis, the CEO of the New York Times Company and a member of the class of 1973, renowned New York Times staffers, Linda Greenhouse and Sam Roberts, Alan Grubman, a founding father of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and a member of the class of 1967, and Big Bird's lawyer, Dan Victor. Now, this year, we are changing our format. Rather than having a lecture and then a discussion, we're going to have a conversation between two experts about the public and the media. Who is leading whom? One expert is our fabulous dean, Nick Allard, who is a bit of a political junkie. And the other is our honored guest, Joe Lockhart, Vice President of Communications at Facebook and former Press Secretary to President Bill Clinton. Now, if you're looking for a presidential debate format with the jabs and the parries and the in the face, this isn't it. Nick and Joe will have a civilized chat, and then they will open the floor to your questions. I'm sure we're in for a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Pre thank you, President Wexler. Can everybody hear me? Is this on? Okay. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, we've got a very exciting program here uh, today. Uh, we've got with us several. Uh, significant Brooklynites and public servants, including District Attorney Joe Hines. We're very grateful to have him here, uh, and our faculty members. Um, but before I introduce our guests, I'd like to introduce him to the audience. So how many 1L students do we have here? All right, they don't know any better. <laughs> how many 2L students? Okay. How many 3L students? All right. Is there a correlation with the fact that last night until about 11.30 or midnight we had the two L's that are mixed and mingled? They seem to be somewhat underrepresented in this audience. Uh, anyway, we're very glad to see them. And how many of our faculty members are here? Terrific. Great staff. How many of those folks are here? We appreciate it. We're really glad to see them. So you have a great cross-section. Uh, of our community, and then also our trustees and alumni. How many of, our, of those of you are here, trustees and alumni, and so on? Great. And then the press. Anybody from the press here? So we know whether we can really have some fun. <laughs> Uh-oh, we have to behave a little bit, Joe. Sure. Okay. So, um, you know, Joe Lockhart uh, has had a dream career. Uh, he's some been saying that. <laughs> He's been described as being both wise and witty, as everyone who grew up in Suffolk, New York, uh, is. Uh, and uh, as Marla knows, uh, and, and uh, he has had uh, an experience where he's been very, very involved as a top press and media person in every presidential campaign, at least since 1980. Uh, really worked uh, at the highest levels with one of the major public relations firms in the country. And as you all know, because the space is so familiar, was the White House press secretary serving under President Clinton. Uh, since then, which we're also very interested in, he has uh, become uh, a top new media guru, expert, most recently working, as uh, President Wexler said, with, with Facebook. So there's a lot, I'm sure, that you want to get into. Um, I'll just jump in uh, right at the start and ask Joe uh, the following. Now, 
This is going to relate to a topic that is near and dear, I think, to our students. I want to ask you about jobs. Uh, now, is that something that the students are interested in hearing about? All right. So, Joe, you know, you, you have had a job, White House Press Secretary, that is one of the best and also one of the worst jobs in the world. How does one become the White House Press Secretary? How does one become Joe Locke? <laughs> I'm not sure you're going to like this answer. Okay. Um, I got into uh, politics because I dropped out of college. So, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, uh, I left school, was looking for something to do, and I literally fell into uh, campaigns. Uh, and ended up, as I like to tell people, senior year was the best three years of my life. Um, uh, because I would do, I, the last three years, to get through the last year and a half, I did a campaign in the fall and to school in the spring. Um, so the, the nice fringe benefit of that was, when I graduated, I had a job. Um, but I think the, um, you know, to try to make a broader point about this, the, I think the way I got there was by willing to try new things, particularly things that I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, a real, um, I think, help to being able to um, uh, you know, stand up and do the briefings every day, which is in, in and of itself a, a challenge, was I had moved um, overseas and couldn't find a job, and I talked my way into a TV station. On uh, Friday and Monday, I was on the air doing a TV report. And I was terrible at it, and thank God there wasn't YouTube there. Um, but it did teach me a little bit about um, just the fundamentals of talking to a camera and, and communicating. Uh, so there was, there literally was no straight line. It was just a series of trials and errors. And I think any success I had was uh, in large part due to the fact that when something came around, I was always willing to try it because I thought as many skills as I could accumulate at some point in my career, they'd come and they would be able to use them. Um, and um, as you know, I told you upstairs, and you seem to get a laugh out of it. Um, uh, it didn't actually please my mother that I took this career path. And when I got like my first really big job in politics, I called her to tell her, and I was in my mid-30s at the time. I thought successful and well on my way, and her response was to say, that's good, it'll look good on your law school application. <laughs> so, well, Joe, Joe, I actually love that answer, and here's why. Uh, one of the things that we've been hearing when we talk to our alumni about what our students need to have successful, meaningful careers with their legal degree, we've been hearing our alumni, our successful alumni, saying how important it was uh, to pursue opportunities as they presented themselves, not necessarily to have a rigid career path. This is a message that Bernie Nash, for example, conveyed. Uh, when he was meeting with our students. And also uh, dealing with adversity, setbacks, being willing to try something, if it doesn't work, make a change. I'll make a little plug, November 6th, we're gonna have a program in this, you know, conversations with alumni and the dean about jobs on just that point, November 6th in the student lounge, where we're having uh, uh, two of our alumni uh, who will be talking just about that, the importance of serendipity in them achieving this fabulous career. So you were actually right on message and uh, went very well. Now this program is titled Media and Society, and so I just throw out a general question. You know, we're in the midst of a presidential election for 18 days until uh, the polls open. Uh, how would you grade the media in the job that they're doing? Well, it's not gonna shock you that I'm not gonna give them a, a good grade. Uh, I, you know, I think we're, we're in a period of profound transition. Um, when, when I started doing, <clears throat> my first campaign I worked on was in 1980, and in 1980, um, <clears throat> at least in the beginning of the year, there was no, there were no 24 hour news stations. Uh, there were, you had choices of three stations, you could watch three networks, and roughly 40, 50, 60 million Americans tuned in every night to listen to one of three um, white men say, here's what happened in the country, and here's what happened in the world. And there was a consensus in the country for what the conversation was. And it was driven uh, by a, a very small elite, mostly here in New York, 
um, but at least was a, a common conversation that, that, was, go that was going on. Um, and it was not, if it was seen as a business, it was seen as not a good business. It was what they called then a loss leader. The, you know, the people at the network said, well, we're, we'll lose money on the news because it gives us credibility to go make money on other things. Technology fundamentally changed that. And now every news program, every news organization is primarily driven by staying afloat or making uh, a large profit. And that's really changed the dynamic of how campaigns are discussed, how campaigns are uh, covered. Uh, the reason I say we're in a period of transition is because I think the answer is at the other end. Uh, we're just not there yet, which is people to, uh, informing each other. Uh, that's, that's where Facebook, that's where Twitter, that's where a number of other social media, but we're not, we're not quite there yet. And, you know, I was struck in, um, uh, uh, you know, the coverage of the debates. But, I mean, these are profound things. You know, the, the future of the country depends on who's the better candidate. And the bulk of the coverage was about facial expressions and laughing and who seemed to have launched the better attack and who had the better defense. It was all about strategy because that's, that's the easy stuff. There was very little digging in on either side. I think you could be a partisan for either side and be very frustrated that Romney didn't reveal what his tax plan really is, or Obama couldn't defend why he hadn't created jobs or cut the deficit the way he wanted and didn't give you a good sense of how to go for it. That's all lost over. And it's all now a system where um, people go to the place where they uh, the reporting is what they want to hear. If you're a conservative, you're more likely to listen to Fox. If you're a liberal, you're more likely to put MSNBC on. Same with newspapers and things, and with, with internet publications and blogs. And it's not, it's just not serving the system well. Now, I could talk for an hour and a half about how the politicians are failing the system also, and it's safe. And, you know, for another hour about how low voter participation doesn't hold either. Um, well, so you got a half a semester class then already. Yeah, so. <laughs> Um, but, well, let me, you know, Joe, let me but, ask but the question was about the media, and I, I think the media is failing. Okay. So let me ask you this. After the uh, debates, uh, the, the, the journalists typically are say who won or who lost. Uh, is that right? Should they be expressing that opinion? Uh, and I guess it's the larger question. Are they reporting a public opinion, or are they shaping it? Well... You know, it's, it's, you'll, you'll notice that in the debate coverage, they do a lot of hedging until the first numbers come out. And then they back up the numbers. So in, in an odd way, that's the right thing, because voters are, are, are responding to what they saw. The, the, the problem is, and again, this is, it's, you know, it's chicken. You just don't know where to start attacking the problem. Is you, you know, most debates are, you know, 55% say one guy won, 50%. By 45% say the other person won. And if the debate's on a Tuesday a Friday, it's 80-20. Because for the next three days, rather than examining what got discussed, who made the better argument, who made an argument that just is nonsense, and then who made an argument that actually makes sense, um, it's all about who won and who lost. And then that just gets reinforced. It's, you know, it's, it's like, you know, if you, if you go into election day, and they, if pollsters have done this, uh, where on election day, some guy wins 51-49. If you take the poll a week later, it's 60-40. Because everyone just psychologically thinks they voted for the one. Even though they didn't. They'll tell a pollster, yeah, I voted for the person for the one. And it's, you can see that in every election. So I think we, you know, it's, um, we'd be well served if we stopped covering politics like it was a sporting event. Where there was a halftime, there were halftime adjustments, and then there was a winner and loser after every debate. Because the reality is, uh, the public processes this information over time. And you don't have big swings uh, off of debate. They happen three or four days after the debate when people really decide, this is what I found important, I've looked at this. And I think the media doesn't give them the tools they need to make you know, the best decision they could. In the election, who is setting the agenda? Is it the candidates who are setting it? Is it the, the news directors? and 
producers of the news media, or is it the public that's setting the agenda, or all of the above? Yeah, I think you know this, this is a this is a uh, balance that has shifted back and forth over the last as long as I've been in this, which is you know a little over thirty years. Uh, when I started, the media very much um, uh, set the agenda, and um, the uh, candidates really had to go through the filter of the elite media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the television networks. And this began to shift, and you know, Ronald Reagan had some very smart people working for him. Um, one of them was a guy by the name of Michael Deaver, who was his image maker. And, and Mike um, uh, did something that and it was written about, where he realized that it didn't matter what the reporter on TV said. In fact, he'd watch the news with the sound down. Because the only thing that mattered as far as moving up was what the picture said. And that began to change the way politicians act, because you know politicians are the greatest imitators. If something works, they're going to do it too. And it became something where you could create a visual story, um, and that the, the substance didn't matter as much. And it didn't really matter what the media said. And I think that began the shift to uh, the, the, the candidates, the public officials setting the agenda rather than the media, and the media following. And both from business reasons and because of that, I think what you've got now is um, uh, most media outlets looking at looking at niche markets of uh, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, and only serving one of the markets. Uh, again, the, the most obvious is the Fox, MSNBC, uh, where I don't think either of them even try to uh, 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 to hide the fact that they're playing to an audience. Uh, it's very just popular. where I had MSNBC this morning. Right? I was just with my people. <laughs> <laughs> not going to do Fox. It's right? Um, and you know, there's there, there's a reason. I mean, it's you know, I, I listen. I had gone on Fox um, when I thought it was important to whoever I was working for, but to go on and try to have a civil discussion about and feel like my voice is going to be heard. I, you know, I, I get better things to do. And I have Republican friends who will say the same thing about MSNBC. So I don't think either of them create a healthy environment. So throughout the history of politics in America, the in this democracy, the way elections are run and the one way that public policy is run is, is impacted by the communications technology of the era. So when you're relying on horses and carriages to deliver information, uh, and you know, literally to collect the vote, get word out, takes months and months, there's one thing. And then you move up into the newspaper era and you have the front porch campaign, where basically the president candidate maybe sits on his front porch and people come to him. Then you have the birth of electronic communications and the radio, television, I'll put them sort of in the same paradigm, same but different, where you know it's a much different thing. And then advertising and communicating it's important, and then suddenly in 1960, what you looked like really made a difference, uh, among other things, so how you connected that way. So that has been the broadcast radio and television paradigm has been the one that governed up until now. And now we're on the verge of new media, new technology. It's had a huge impact in how money is raised. Uh, how you communicate with your ads and so on. You suggest some, but you can tell us a little bit where you think we are. Is is the you know are we done with the broadcast paradigm? Have we completely you know how far out are we before we shift over completely? Yeah, I think we're pretty far. The, the broadcast paradigm is pretty far along, pretty much done. But again, these things are impossible to predict, and so I don't know whether it's the next cycle or the cycle after that. Um, you know, I, I, my first experience with the internet as a um, influential factor was, you know, I was in, I, I worked in the White House, and there was this little thing going on called impeachment. Um, for all your first years, it's you know, way back in history for that. Um, they were and, in elementary school, they told me. Yeah, and, and I, you know, there were one day, um, a reporter from the Wall Street Journal called me and said, um, we have a report that someone at the White House just went into the grand jury and testified to these facts. And, you know, I said, well, let me check. I said, you know, what time, you know, give me till 5 o'clock. I'll, I'll try to run this down. 
ran it down. It turns out that no one had testified to those set of facts. He had just gotten a bad piece of information. And I called him back and uh, said, you know, don't run that. It's not true. And if you run it, we're going to come down on you pretty hard because I can actually demonstrate that that person wasn't in D.C. that day or something like that. And he said, well, we got a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, well, we've already run the story. We put it out on the Internet. Our internet version. I said, well, you know, why'd you do that? He said, well, we were afraid that this guy, Matt Drudge, would, would get there first and then we'd look bad. I said, well, you know, you're wrong. And the, what happened over the next hour in the Wall Street Journal was in an awkward position because it, for the first time they ran a correction on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for a story that was never in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> because the, the reporter said to me, well, we'll just run a correction online. I said, oh, no, you won't. I said, you've, you've determined the entire news cycle today. You've got to put it in your newspaper. Online, maybe a couple thousand people saw it. Again, this was 12 years ago. Uh, over a million read the newspaper. They have been told by every other news outlet that the Wall Street, so I want the Wall Street Journal to write on their front page that this story is not true. It ended up being a difficult thing for them to write because they just had never written anything like that. And a story not reported in this paper we have to, but they did, and that was that, that was really a first. Now, the, the problem is everything is so instantaneous that the facts catch up much later. You know, so it does encourage people to make wild and unsubstantiated charges because by the time the facts catch up, the news is done. And well, now you have more fact checkers because you have a 10 million fact checkers, don't you? Uh, you know, that's, that's like saying that um, uh, the internet will um, fail in China because they have 100,000 sensors. Content producers are always going to be the checkers or the sensors. And you can, you can check a fact, but it's already gotten into what you know, I'll call the media bloodstream. Uh, and it's very, very hard to punish the you know, purveyors of this when it's somebody you know, sitting in their mother's basement. You know, with a with a computer sort of saying that they're a reporter. Uh, so that's really again when I was talking before about being in transition, we're in this period now where there there is no sense of political authority. Uh, there isn't a big difference between um, you know someone who's on their own, um, who's just writing what they think, and someone who works at the New York Times. And you know I have an enormous respect for the New York Times as an institution. I actually do think they try. To, but when it comes to downstream media, they don't see the difference. What do you put the New York Post in there? Uh, I'm just downstream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was said in the last campaign by some people that President Clinton, who may be the best, one of my favorite Washington things that are worse. Some people say. Some I always say, "Tell me who, or this conversation's over." <laughs> This is more, this is just my opinion. President Clinton is um, a 
great communicator, great politician, probably the you know in his time the most criticized politician in history. He had, he had a way of internalizing that, not taking it personally most of the time, and turning it to his effect. This was a new campaign for him. He was defending his wife, not defending himself, and that was a whole different dynamic. And he took it personally. Every single thing that got said about Hillary, he took personally uh, because of the dynamic. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't, he, he, he would read stuff about him that was crazy, that he'd laugh or understand, this is why they're doing this. But Hillary was like, this is wrong, and I have to correct that wrong. And that's a, that's a dangerous place when you're in a campaign to be taking things personally and to, reacting, to be reacting emotionally. Again, it works on occasion. It doesn't work at every stop. And I think that's what, uh, I think that um, uh, undermined him more than, the fact that we were living in a more connected world, although that certainly um, uh, you know, was a factor. What an interesting insight, and also just a footnote, my wife Marla just told me that you're right and I'm wrong, so that's further part of what we But don't worry, that's not such an uncommon thing. But, but I already knew that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So let me ask you a few questions about Facebook, okay? Yeah, sure. So you know most Shakespeare plays nowadays get the same play, but they move them into a modern era or a different era. So take the Lewinsky affair and put it in the Facebook era. How would that place? Uh, how would that play? Would it play out any differently? You know, in the Facebook era, uh, or would it be more or less the same out there? Boy, that's a disturbing thing to think about. <laughs> um, I mean, it's the difference between Bill Clinton and what happened in some respect, some of the more recent. I, here, I, I don't know that I'd put it in the Facebook context, but I, I, let me put it in a broader context of what you were referring to, that things are so connected and so immediate. Um, you know, I think that we, we could have had a fundamentally different outcome. 2012 than in 1998. One of the um, the underlying reasons the president um, not only survived but thrived in that period was he had the time to create a different narrative, which is Republicans are overreaching. They're trying to keep me from doing my job, and I, that's fine. They can do whatever they want. I'm going to focus on serving the American people every day. And while you know, there were moments of time when, and in private where he'd be angry. He never saw that in, in public. Every, no matter what the question was, no matter what he was charged with, when he was out and there were cameras, he said, I'm focused on doing my job. That had a, um, that gave Democrats who were in charge of his fate on the Hill um, uh, confidence that they could withstand this. Every, almost everybody involved what, what was going on with Bill. That his, that his behavior was wrong and removing him from office for that behavior was wrong. Uh, but Washington is a town that's built on power and the pursuit of power. And the Republican leadership at that time looked at it and said, you know what, here's a chance for us to regain power. We can weaken the Democrats, weaken the president, and maybe not remove him, but certainly set up the next election. Uh, privately, many of them would say, yes, what we're doing is wrong here uh, constitutionally. So there was that, as I think in the environment we're in now, where every minute of every day there's a new piece of information, a new charge, it would have, um, it could potentially have undermined uh, the Democrats' ability to stand up and, and defend the president. So I don't, it's, it's, it's a disturbing question, I don't know that seriously. Um, not just because I have to think about that again. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to know. Could have gone to the other side. It could have been that the you know, president's ability to go out and talk that time to that for um, uh, more attention. But I think there's a very delicate balance. And you know, if you've read the history of this, I'm not even sure the reporters and authors of the about this understand just quite how tenuous uh, the, the the president's uh, hold on the presidency was. And if you, you throw in the sort of nonsense that uh, masquerades for journalism now. Uh, now, I'll tell you this, there was a standard for journalism of 
you know, two tourists from every store, and that was mildly going away. It was ended on the second day of the Lewinsky story, uh, writ large by reporters, and they were very open about it, which is this is too big a story to have standards for. And we just can't be left behind. And I can't tell you how many times people got something wrong. And they didn't worry about it because they were on to the next thing. Um, uh, so maybe it comes out the same way. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a bad situation on steroids that happened now. And I think, as you see now, in these sorts of scandals, um, it's almost, there's almost an inevitability. Uh, because because the, the game is, and what sells, is finding a winner and a loser quickly. We don't want six months of battle. We want a week, maybe two weeks, like a good TV miniseries. Um, you know, you got to have somebody. Someone's got to leave in disgrace, and someone's got to stand up and be a winner. Well, that's... Uh get a lot to, uh, to think about. In terms of the new media and its impact generally, both on journalism and on our society, um, what do you see ahead around the corner? In terms, where are we heading? What are some of the big developments to look for? It's the, it's, it's the great um, antidote to what is wrong now. Uh, and technology is just beginning to scratch the surface of the promise. What, what you've had historically over the last 40 or 50 years is a fundamental erosion of trust in any large institution, uh, whether it's the media, whether it's the government. And where do you turn when you don't trust some central power? You turn to your friends. Uh, if you look at the 2004 campaign, um, one of the reasons why Bush beat Kerry was they ran a different campaign. I worked for Kerry, and I, I, you know, I couldn't understand. They, they had... They had money that I, you know, we watch each other very closely in the campaign. You can see where they're spending. They had money I knew they weren't spending. And they had a whole separate campaign of going out and talking just to influencers. Because they knew that people in communities would, you know, if you could find the right people, they would talk to their friends. Because people didn't believe what they read in the newspaper any longer. And what things like Facebook and Twitter and social media at large is now given an architecture for that to actually become meaningful and at scale. For, for politics and politicians. Because now you can very easily access uh, what your friends think about something. And you see things that happen. There are a couple of uh, examples of things that happen that become issues and stories that get resolved much quicker because friends are talking about it and they have a way and it becomes viral and has a power. You know, two things. One recent one, now maybe a year old. But, you know, a, a very effective campaign that was set off by Planned Parenthood in the aftermath of the Susan B. Komen issue. I don't know if everybody remembers that. But there was, there was um, some controversy about uh, some of the board members there and, and a position they had taken. Um, and very effectively used the network of people to have a campaign go viral that ended up uh, having the organization change their leadership. It was, you, know, you could see this. It was just a matter of time. You know, I, in watching the debate on Tuesday night, whatever it was, um, with the second debate with President um, uh, Obama and Governor Romney, I think this um, this little story that Romney was talking about with um, attracting women to his cabinet and this binder or something. Pre-social media, yeah, maybe. Maybe a couple guys, you know, in a studio would have said, actually, a couple of guys wouldn't have noticed it. Maybe, maybe someone, a woman on the set would have said, you know, I found that would be a little weird, but I think it would have gone away. I think what social media does is it allows things that, you know, you know, real people see that catch their attention to make it, to, to validate it and allows people to share it. Uh, and that's, that's much more real than what, a, you know, a couple of people like me sitting in a TV studio think. And there's real power to that. And eventually, um, you know, I think that's going to be the main area of where debate happens. It's, it's actually going to be where I think people register to vote and vote. Uh, and that, I think, you know, as long, as long as people have the tools and the access to the right information to make an intelligent decision, I think the system is in good shape. Now, if people don't choose to use those tools, that's their problem. But I think we're now in this period where people, they don't quite have what they need yet. 
Uh, but that's, that's, I think, I think that's where the answer is. And I think that's, you know, to the extent that we go through convulsions in our democracy, this is the latest one, and that's the going in the time. So technologically, we have the ability to run the country like American Idol. You know, and every government decision basically asks people to vote what they want us to do. Should we run the government that way? Well, I, you know, it's, I, you know, on the surface, my answer is supposed to be, of course, not that silly. Let me try something a little bit different, which is look at look at American Idol and look at which I have to admit I've never seen, so I'm making this part up. <laughs> look at the, the concept of American Idol. This is about people who watch, who care a lot about music. We care a lot about whether someone has talent or not. And they have a real discussion with their friends over who, and, and it's, they may talk about, I, she's a great singer but has no presence. She, they may say that, you know, she's got presence but doesn't have as, but there's a real discussion about the merits. I don't know that there's a real discussion going on with everyday Americans about the merits of politics right now. It's very much sort of just picking a side and just saying no matter what your side does, you know, it has to be really bad. It has to be like Obama in the first debate for me to say the Democrat didn't win. I mean, if he was just this much better, I would have been proud to say, oh, he won. But I mean, sometimes you can't have a straight face. Um, so again, I don't think it's, it's, it's not a popularity contest, but if you look at what goes on um, uh, uh, online, on the internet, in these social networks, people are, are making, you know, important decisions. I, it's, when I used to talk about this when the internet, when the internet first got involved in politics, um, and it, it really wasn't that big a deal. But you, I would go and talk to you know a school, and I'd, I'd ask people how many people had an iPod or how many people had this, and you know I'd say, well, how did you pick that one? And they'd go through this uh, explanation about how they went online, and they found all the features, and they found six different uh, products they could buy. They looked at the features of the product, they looked at the price of the product, and they bought it. And I'd say, well, who are you gonna vote for? And they'd say, well, I don't know, I just don't know what they stand for. <laughs> I said, well, you know, you can go do the same thing. Go to their website, look at the features, look at the price, and they'd look and say, what? <laughs> it's the same thing. It's, if, you know, the, 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 the democracy will work if people are informed. You know, we may make stupid decisions, uh, or wrong decisions, but it, it's 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 not going to work when when people just don't know why they're for something or against something. I think we're very much there right, right now. Yeah, interesting. So another sort of related question in terms of public policy: uh, if new media, advanced broadband connectivity, is increasingly key to participate in democracy, to, to participate in, with government services. Um, what do you do about the people who don't have ex access to affordable broadband? Well, don't have the knowledge. Yeah, I mean, the, the great part about that is technology is going to solve that. There's, you know, it's it, 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 broadband or access to technology was a huge issue in the 1990s when the desktop cost a lot of money. It still costs a lot of money for a lot of people. But you go any place in the world now, to the most from the most developed world to the undeveloped world, you'll find that everybody's got some sort of mobile device in their hand. And that's what, you know, a company like Facebook, that's what the strategy is based on. There's seven billion people in the world. Two billion have access to the internet now. We think in 10 years, it'll be probably five billion. And the four, the, the, there's a, a billion people on Facebook. If, if Facebook goes from a billion to five billion, whatever, then the four billion will primarily be on smartphones. Or, or you know, even the feature phones that you can get access, but they're not little computers in your hand. So there, need, there will need to be investment in, in, in broadband, but I think that's happening. Uh, and that's happening um, organically around the world because you can't have economic development without connectivity now. I think, I think people understand that. And the technology and the manufacturing here are making these things so cheap that they, they cheap to free. Uh, that they will be available and ubiquitous. So you do have a system where they, where um, connectivity will be democratized. Um, if you know, unless and, you know, it's, don't tell my Democrat friends I said it. Unless government gets in the way, 
and, and regulates in such a way that you know the market can He's now in the private sector. Yeah. I always believed that, I just didn't say it out loud. So. <laughs> Well, let me ask you just a few questions about your, your actual service as White House Press Secretary, then we'll open this up. Uh, this is this is where he gets to Lewinsky. It always works this way. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, speaking of Lewinsky, <laughs> some people said. <laughs> Also, to the extent you can, you know, you were inside the room, uh, which I'm sure was very difficult in a minute. Can you, to what extent can you just take us inside the room and kind of give us uh, a sense of what it was like? Yeah, um, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, and they ask, thank God, less often now than, than they used to. A lot of people will, will say, well, you know, how could you keep working? How could you, you know, why didn't, why didn't everyone just get up and resign? And that, that's, there are harder parts to this question, but that's the easy part. Because I think we all felt like, well, first off, in the beginning, we didn't know what the facts were. And we weren't willing to jump to the same conclusion that anyone who got a microphone stuck in their face would come to. But as the facts became clear to us, um, I think um, we all had a common feeling, because nobody left. And we were, you know, some of us could have been craven. Uh, it couldn't all be. I mean, there has to be some, you know, backbone somewhere in the room. Uh, and I think it was, for us, it was that however wrong the president was in what he did, um, the constitutional implications and the broader implications of removing someone for private behavior, uh, uh, in this case, would be so detrimental to the future of the presidency that uh, uh, this was worth it. And, and, and a lot of it, it became not so much about the individual president, but about protecting uh, the office. Because you can actually see if, um, if that president did was worth removing, you know, removed from office, the next president did be something else. Uh, uh, for, um, you know, for President Bush, it could have been launching the war in Iraq, which a lot of people disagreed with. But what if one of the consequences of deciding whether you send this country into a war or not becomes, well, if I do it, I'm going to get impeached. Uh, that's not good. And we ought to be making these decisions based on what's in our national security. So I think, um, uh, you know, I, but you're right, it was hard. I, the, the, one, the one story I like to tell is, you know, one, one of my jobs in the White House was, White House is a group of very much type A people, all of whom think they know everything. And it's like, it's, you know, that kid in school, like in high school, who was really annoying and maybe the answer raised her hand? They all go to the White House. It's like all the way the Or they join law school faculties. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so everybody thinks they've got to be the person with, um, uh, to tell the president, you know, here's what you should say when you get asked this question. One of my jobs was to tell some really, really important, powerful people, you're not allowed in the room. Because we'd have to get, every time the president went out to do an event, we would prepare him. So just, you know, you're going to get this question. Here's what we think you should answer. We'd have a little debate. He'd go out. Um, the day the Lewinsky story broke, um, just because just because we had three national interviews scheduled, um, just, I mean, just because, karma. And we couldn't cancel it because we, we just made the decision that we had to go through them. And again, you know, one of my jobs was to keep you out of the room. And I remember going to the, um, the president has a little dining room off the Oval Office. And walking around the president, looking around, there's nobody there. And this guy. And I, I kept waiting, I kept waiting. And like, nobody showed up. And it was just the two of us. And I was like, I guess I'll be preparing you myself, Mr. President. <laughs> and I had to, had to like, get on the phone and get the, his, at least get legal counsel down to come to the room. Uh, but it was like on that day where normally it was 50 people trying to get in that room, and I was kind of like, they all found more important things to do. Like so, there was a, the, the serious point on how we got through all this was, uh, and this came from the president's direction, 98, 99% of the White House staff never sat in on a meeting about Lewinsky, 
impeachment, any of the stuff, the congressional action, they were all told, if you can't focus on your work, go find another job. Uh, there was a small group of us, roughly 10 people, who dealt with this on a daily basis. Who were those people? Let's see, it was a couple of the president's lawyers, for obvious reasons, uh, a couple of the president's congressional liaisons, again, because keeping that in mind, a couple of communications people, um, one of the janitors, because we liked him. That's it. I mean, it really was. It was a. It was, a Thank you. It was, was uh, the first lady in? No. Um, the first lady had her own um, private channel of communication with the president. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Now, more generally, just to wrap up uh, before we open this up, uh, you not only have been described uh, as wise and witty, but as press secretary, uh, you have a reputation for being a pit bull. You were described as being a pit bull. Now, is that fair? And if, if, if it's not fair, what kind of a dog would you be? <laughs> sort of come through this, you know, uh, evolution where they're now like cute and cuddly, so whatever. <laughs> but I, listen, I, I, I don't know what kind of dog I'd be in. Did I ask you this on the law school application? <laughs> <laughs> if I was a tree, what kind of tree would I be? Um, I think that um, the president, whoever he or she is, whatever party you think, deserves forceful representation. smart, they know how to go find a story, um, and, you know, they, they're thick-skinned enough to handle some back and forth. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong uh, with that. Uh, You're I talking would, to lawyers here, so yeah. No, I, 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 would, I, I, would, uh, I would argue that in addition to that, um, you know, again, the public sees about 10% of the press secretary job, the briefing every day. That's a very small part of the job. It would take up maybe two hours of my day, an hour or so to prepare, maybe an hour to do it. Privately uh, and outside the view of the camera, there is an enormous amount of work that goes on back and forth, and I viewed that just as strongly that I needed to be cooperative there because the media had a job. Uh, I think there have been some administrations, both Democrat and Republican, that believe that there isn't legitimacy in the media and you can just shut them out. I didn't believe that. I believe that they had a right to have access to the president, I had a right to have access to what he was doing and thinking, uh, and worked hard to make sure that they got that access. At times, putting myself at odds to the senior White House staff. Uh, but, you know, in public, uh, there's a lot of talk about how when you're the press secretary, you serve two masters, the press, you know, the public. And some of that is true, but by and large, you know, the president signs your paycheck and he deserves, uh, given particularly where the media has evolved as so adversarial, the president deserves a strong uh, uh, force to make his case, make his or her case. And I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Great. Well, I'm just glad you didn't bark at me when I asked you that question. <laughs> uh, so, last question from me uh, is Is there a fraternity of White House press secretaries, are you in touch? Uh, do you exchange, compare notes, or maybe get some advice, or, you know, from Jim Brady to Marlon Fitzwater, or Andrew Fleischer, all of them? Yeah. Curry? Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's a unique experience, you know, to, to, to go through that. And I've, any of, any, if you've read any of the history of it, there literally is, and it started with, I think, Ron Nesson in 1970. Five seconds with Gerald Ford, who there's a little closet in the press secretary's office, and he left a flak jacket, literally a <laughs> Telbar jacket. But it's this not got a nice pattern, and it's a vest on it, so you could actually wear it. Um, and in the side pocket of it is a note from every press secretary to the next. Um, and it, there is a fraternity because, um, as hard as we try, some try harder than others to explain what it was like, you don't know until you've done it. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't just yell at each other all the time, but at least it's with some sense of what the other people have gone through. And we tend to, 
get together every couple of years for something, right? You know, um, uh, during in the aftermath of September 11th, uh, President Bush was uh, gracious and I think smart uh, 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 to bring in all the former press secretaries and brief us on what was going on with um, you know how the government was dealing with September 11th. Uh, sometimes it's less um, you know tragic when, when Tony Snow passed away. We all gathered. And there really was no question that person. And, and you know, I, I vaguely knew Tony, but it was, um, you know, it was the thing to do just because uh, his family knew that these, this was a group of people who had experienced uh, what he had. So it is, you know, it's a, it's a, a smallish group, um, and you know, it's. I'm, I'm not sure you'd want to come to dinner with us, but um, you can get the. Oh, well, I know you would never pick up the tab. Right? That is exactly true. <laughs> So uh, that, I mean, particularly that last uh, uh, vignette is just, I think it's so important in many ways because it reveals an aspect of Washington that, uh, and our government that is not sort of the general, you know, conventional wisdom on how things operate and that there is sort of a level of we're in this for the nation and some collegiality, so thank you for that. So I, I, I will tell you one more thing on the notes between the, Washington's a city where there are no secrets. I mean, I don't care whether it's <laughs> national security or, you know, what the president, you know, you know, uh, you know, snuck off and had lunch with another world leader. Everything gets known eventually. And the people who generally do the talking are people like me. Uh, the one thing that no one, I have never seen a public reference to a single word in those notes. I've read them all. I've read them all up to the point when I left. I have not. So what did they that. say? Would <laughs> <laughs> um, my would my lawyer object at that point? <laughs> you know, I'm just, as your attorney, I'm going to advise not to ask yes. that So Joe, I, I'm going to open this up, but I do sure. want at this point to say that this is incredibly interesting. Um, it, you've given us a lot uh, to think about. Uh, and it has also been, I think, captivating. And uh, we are really in your debt. We really, really appreciate it. You know, well, if I could just say one thing. Now, let's have some hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody got a question? We have some microphones, and because this is recorded, being recorded, I would ask you to make sure that the microphone gets to you. There's one up the front right here. Um, first of all, it's impressive that after 30 years in Washington, you still have such optimism. Um, but with respect to people informing one another about issues, I think that works in a lot of ways. Uh, but there are some issues about which people that talk to each other on Facebook just aren't going to have access to the information that they need to make an informed decision. And I think that's one important role that the professional media can play. Um, and so I wonder um, what you think about that, and where you think that information will come from. Yeah, and um, I'm not sure I'm as optimistic uh, as you, as I portray. I mean, I, I, it's a hope uh, more than a um, knowing that it's. I don't think it's inevitable. And I think right now the reason I think we're in, you know, I keep talking about this transition period. Is right now there is a lot of sharing, but it's all there's just as much sharing of ignorance as knowledge. Um, and you know, I just I don't have what I what I don't have the faith in is there being a professional um, uh, core of you know centralized journalism that's 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 going to inform that because I think we you know we, we don't have that now. Um, I do think people. As they get access to information, you know, again, people, um, you know, if you're you're sitting in a house and you have a family with you know three kids, you don't use the same sort of arithmetic that Washington uses. You you know how much is coming in, you know what you can spend, and you know how you can run up all your credit cards. Um, but you you know you have a sense of what your life. Is. But there's a disconnect. There's like there's just you know as many people who think the 
Obama plan will solve the debt crisis is the Romney plan. And frankly, neither of them will. And neither of them, you know, you, you give them in a private moment, and they know they're just kicking the, 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 the can down the road. And that they will, there, there is a solution, but the people who um, are for the solution are what we like to call former members of DC lobbyists. You know? Yeah. No, it's, that's, a, that's a compliment. People get up and tell the truth and are straight with their constituents. One of them is lobbyists because they get defeated. Um, and that's just, that's, that's the reality. Um, uh, but I do think, you know, as these big sort of government political issues where people get access to information that they have now in running their daily lives, that people can be more informed uh, and can gather the information and make uh, their own opinion. Now, if the, you know, if the country decides to line up and decide that, you know, uh, you know that 40 percent of the country still thinks the president isn't an American, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and uh, you, you can you can you can give them the tools, whether they use them or not. You know, it, it is a hope. I'd like to get some questions from students. What are the, yes, sir. In the back behind you, Chris. Sorry, my name is Imre and I'm a one out. And I wanted to ask you about this amount of information that we have available. So research tells us that the more information we have, the more ill-equipped we are to make sense of it and make a logical decision, especially when we have to explain our reasons. Um, and in those cases, we end up making choices based on emotions. Do you feel like this overwhelming amount of information we have online is driving or at least escalating the campaign's focus on emotional um, cues? Uh, and if so, what gives you hope in overcoming this? Because you seem to be optimistic about the future. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, let me answer that a couple ways. So the first thing is that, you know, I went into the Obama campaign headquarters about three or four months ago to just go, I was in Chicago, I wanted to say hi to someone. And um, I walked in and it was a room probably 10 times the size filled with people, you know, like desks and computers working hard. And I said to my friend, oh, those must be all the field organizers. And they laughed. I said, no, no, we won't really. They're all out in the field. We don't have anybody here. And I said, no, oh, they must be the fundraisers. And he said, no. And I said, well, who are these people? And they said, these are our social media people, hundreds of them, creating content. Create content for particular groups of people. And it's the same thing exists in the wrong headquarters. I'm, I'm certain I haven't been there. Uh, I'm certain. I, I think the. I, I think you're right. And I think there's an evolution here, which is the first thing we need to do is organize information. And the algorithms that make Google help us with that, they index information. So you can now go. Um, but what is hard to do with a simple Google search is to, is to gauge. You know, well, should I believe this, or how accurate is this? And that's where I think the algorithms that make up social come in, because you're able to take this information, pull stuff, and then use your friends as a resource. And there's, again, in any in the, in the most basic communities, thousands of years ago, people solved issues by going to the person they thought knew something about a particular subject. So it's not just politics. If your car breaks down. I think you know which one of your friends, you just kind of know instinctually, who do I call to ask about this? Because you have experience. I think that's what, you know, that's really what the hope is that when we come to politics, that people will be able to use the genius of Google to index and gather, and then use the genius of social to put it together to make a more informed, maybe it'll be a more emotional decision. But if, I, I'm, I can live with that as long as it's more informed. And what, what is hard to live with, and again, I'm, I'm not picking on a, a particular part of the Republican Party here, but how do you have a conversation with someone where you're talking about, and their answer to everything is, well, he's, he shouldn't be president because he's not a citizen. It's a short conversation. You go, you go someplace else. <coughs> yes. So. Hi, I'm Summer. I'm a 2 well. Um, I'm curious. So you, you know, you spoke a little bit, obviously, with the great you know perspective that you have in terms of. I remember after the um, 
Bush re-election, uh, Michael Moore, who I'm not necessarily a fan of, but there was this quote he made that stood out to me when they asked him, why do you think Bush won? And he said, you know, I feel like the Democrats just got outstaged, that the Republicans know how to put on a show. And kind of from that to the evolution of what you were discussing in our current debates and the reflection of what is the media focusing on and just the general glamorization and kind of, you know, glossing of what's really important versus the substance that we should be focusing on. Do you feel that the media is leading that charge and setting that agenda for us as constituents and voters? Or do you feel like they're really a reflection of kind of the inundation of information that we receive in our own, you know, for lack of a better phrase, ADD culture and that desire to not be given the details and to want to kind of be able to just judge on that emotional reaction and not have to seek out the details and the substance that we really should be voting? Well, I've got two answers to that. Uh, on the media part, um, I think the, the media is uh, complicit with the campaigns because the media now wants to put on a show. Uh, again, the, the heavy focus in the debate after that is on style as opposed to both candidates said things that are just not true. Right? I think we could sit here and we could go through a chart and we could go through them. I can find stuff wrong with both people in a, in a nonpartisan way. I, I lean into Romney a little harder, but that's, that's um, but you, there's just not really a discussion. Yeah, there's these, the, there's fact checkers, but even that's almost part of the show now. Let's let's go over to the red carpet and see what they said that isn't true. And it's it, it is it, it is a big game. I think both sides. Put on a show, it's a different show. One's not really better than the other. I think Michael Moore's totally wrong on that. Bush didn't win because he outstaged. In fact, I, I think, if anything, Bush ran a very lackluster campaign. Um, uh, it just wasn't, he, he, Bush is not a great campaigner. Um, you can argue about his presidency. Uh, but uh, Bush won, I was in that campaign working for John Kerry. He won uh, because he had. He effectively tapped into America's um, fear um, about uh, the post 9 11 world and, and, and the, the, whether it be the Al Qaeda network or terror. And he effectively framed the choice, and we worked hard to reframe it as one which is, you know, <coughs> I'm not perfect, I'm not, but, but we're in the middle of something. It's too dangerous to change uh, courses now. Um, Exactly, exactly what I would have done. And in fact, you're seeing a version of it now. What Obama's saying is the world financial crisis was so damaging and so debilitating, and we're at a point right now where we're just about to make it right. And the worst thing you could do is to bring on a whole new team and a whole new philosophy. To, and we'll see who wins. I mean, I, you know, um, neither one of them are so compelling that the election was going to be a blowout. Bush won by. 130,000 votes in Ohio. We, we'd switch 65,000 votes, John Kerry would be president. You know, we just didn't do it. We, we came up short. We're going to have the same dynamic in two and a half weeks. And you're going to look at Ohio or Virginia or North Carolina and say, God, if they could just have turned this. And it's 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 the same basic argument. And that's what politics is. And there's, you know, I, there's, it's the way it should be. You know, you make your best, you make your best argument. And I, I never felt during the 2004 campaign that Bush should have been running any other kind of campaign. I, you know, he, the economy was in recession. He, he couldn't, that really wasn't a winner. Uh, and he, 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 he went all in on uh, you know, uh, security and counterterrorism, and that was a place where John Kerry had trouble competing. And uh, the politics are about making the most advantageous case for yourself. So I don't think it's because, I, listen, I think that I, I referenced Reagan before. There was a period in the 80s and the early 90s when the Republicans were way ahead, that they realized that stagecraft was essential to campaigning. Uh, the Democrats caught up, and they now it just depends on who the, best act, who the actor is as opposed to some institutional advantage uh, from either side. Do you have any students on the, this side of the, any questions over here? Okay, yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name's Josh. I'm Dale. Um, I think what you brought up about you know consulting with people in your community is a really 
interesting point. Um, but I wonder about the whether it's analogous in social media. And one key distinction might be that what you're saying creates a record. So personally, I, I often don't feel comfortable um, sharing my opinion online because there might be adverse consequences down the line, um, whether you say something wrong or you know if you're going for a job interview or perhaps you, you might be, um, your position might make it such that you're not allowed to, to voice your opinion on that matter. I'm wondering how, how you deal with that. I, you, know, you start in any, you know, like about five different directions on that. Um, so let me show you, I have my Facebook hat on first, which is I think you'll find that the evolution of these social networks, the, the thing that's changing most rapidly is the amount of privacy controls you have that even a year ago weren't there. You know, right now you literally can decide. If you want to say, hey, I know everybody thinks I'm voting for Obama, but I think Romney's the guy, you can have 20 people see that, you can have the whole world see that. Uh, so there are some controls, but there are also some risks. It doesn't mean that a close friend of yours isn't going to share it with someone else. Um, on the other hand, that you know, it's, you could also say to the person sitting next to you the same thing, and she might tell five people, and you've got the same risk. The second thing is, um, I, you know, I, I have talked to and read about because this is an area of concern, uh, a bunch of um, recruiters who now use social networks to, to try to get a better sense of people. And they are unanimous in saying, when we see a sanitized Facebook page, we don't hire them. Because it means either they're hiding something from us, or they've got no life. <laughs> and I, I'm not making this up. They've, they've said, we want to see people with a full experience. And yes, that might be included out at social events, or saying something about politics, or weighing in something there. We're looking for a fuller um, uh, um, sense of, you know, uh, who the person the person is. On the on the broader question of community, there's a there's a great book that a couple of guys I know wrote. Uh, this is where a lot of this thinking started. Uh, called, it's called Applebee's America. And it was written in 2006. And this was the theory. The theory is that um, the guys who started Applebee's, the stores that I, I doubt they had one in New York. It's more of a outside of Upstate. more rural um, than you know, urban. Suffer. Exactly. <laughs> Probably does. Um, but their whole idea was they thought that the traditional way of advertising, that the model was broken. And the way they were going to get customers in the store is they were going to go into communities and find the people who influenced the other people. And they had a theory that for every, for every 10 people, there was one influencer, whether it be in a family or in a work environment. And they found ways to micro-target people that Applebee's was a great place to go eat, it was a great place for your family. And they do a little bit of advertising, uh, you know, but it's just to support this. And the guys who wrote the book basically wrote it, and it was one guy from the Bush campaign in 2004, one guy from the Kerry campaign, wrote the book about how politicians and campaigns were applying that very principle to how you target voters and how you persuade and communicate with voters. And what changed from 2006 to now is it was a theory, but it was very hard to put into practice. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the entire architecture for implementing this, social networks, built up. So I think you'll find um, uh, we, we may very well be two and a half weeks from now in a situation where Obama wins by half a percentage point, and we legitimately give credit because they were much more aggressive in micro-targeting and social media. They're just a little bit ahead, the Republicans, only because, and this is counter to the way things normally work. Normally what happens in campaigns is one side wins, the other side goes off, and after shooting everybody, you know, and after like mass executions within the party for who's to blame, there's a couple of people left standing, and they become the aggressive innovators. They say, well, what we did last time didn't work. Let's try something new. And technology is a, a big piece of that. The people who win get lazy, like, we won, we don't have to change. And that's why we keep switching, you know, and, and you know, it's why we have the system we have. The Obama people this time never let up. They, I think, they, for whatever reason, they made the decision that this was the future, that technology, the internet, social networks were the way to communicate. And I think they do have an advantage. Um, 
And the question is, how much? What does that mean? And I think if Obama wins by five points or Romney wins by five points, we're not gonna, it's not going to matter. We're not going to debate. But if it's a, the close election everyone expects, I think there's, you're going to see a lot of analysis on what that meant. What did, how did, te, you know, did technology give them the advantage? And then what you're going to see is, because politics is a, you know, active, reactive business, you're going to see every Republican you can find investing every last minute and every last dollar in technology uh, to catch up. Uh, and, you know, we're just as likely four years from now to be having the opposite conversation about challenger, I don't know, I don't know who the Republican front will be the day after the election, you know, and his great technolog you know, technological advantage on the Democrats. So I think we should wrap up, but I'm going to ask for one more student Crisp's question and then give Professor Askin the last question, uh, since we've been touching on his field. And well, uh, what, whatever. What, <laughs> Chris picks up, yeah, right there. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm a 1L. Um, thank you for coming today. There's two related questions for you. What would you say to the contention that the mainstream media sensationalizes and shapes news coverage to win more viewers for advertising revenue? And overall, what is the role of ad revenue um, in agenda setting in the news? Uh, yes, and huge. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think there are um, pockets of the main street, uh, main street media, the mainstream media, which has become an art form in and of itself, and how you define it. Uh, I think there are a couple of newspapers left that are driven by journalism and not by business. But that's it. You know, if you look at the landscape, the problem isn't. And that, that isn't the biggest problem. You know, you go around the country and you're looking at major cities that don't have daily newspapers anymore. Um, but the ones who are still trying to put out them seven days a week, with a very few exceptions, are letting their business interests drive their editorial decisions. And that, when I started doing that, I did not believe that to be uh, uh, the case. Uh, and, you know, that answers the second question, which is, you know, you, you um, why is MSNBC successful? Why is Fox News successful? Because they have found an audience. Uh, I mean, I don't think Roger Ailes started with Fox and thought, I'm going to have two million viewers all day long and I'm going to become even richer than I already am. I think he started it because he thought, you know, the news media is slanted, they're all liberal, and I want an outlet. Uh, and he stumbled upon a gold mine. So why do they report the news now the way they do? Because I think the gold mine has taken over. Why did MSNBC come out of obscurity and you know find this niche? Well, it, it wasn't it wasn't journalism that took them there. It, it was mm -hmm. profit, uh, and that's just we're just in a different place than we were when I started doing this 30 years ago, where it was acceptable for news organizations to lose money. And, and it just was part of was part of the public interest. Uh, we, did, we just don't have that anymore, and it's reflected in what you see. Um, you know, I, you know, my guess is, is even if that first debate had happened, and, and it did, you would see some. You would see everybody covering this campaign, talking about how it was tight, whether it was or not, because that's how you keep viewers. No one's going to stand up at you know, 3 o'clock this afternoon and say, we looked at all the numbers, there's two weeks till last night, and it's over, so you might want to turn on Real Housewives of New Jersey, because not, we got nothing for you here. Um, so, it's, it is, it's, and uh, there, again, there's just a couple of places that are immune to that, uh, either by history or by, you know, you take something like, whether you like it or not, the New Republic, that's just been bought by a very wealthy, wealthy former Facebook employee, he's not going to worry about advertising. He's got a point of view. But again, it's a point of view. He's, you know, as bright as, as he is, he is not trying to make sure that everybody knows what they need to know. He's trying to make sure that everybody needs, everybody has his point of view. And that's, that's different than what the media used to sort of be. Let's ask it. 
actually a perfect segue for the question I want to ask. Uh, uh, I am someone who strongly believes in the transformative democratizing power of new media. But I've got to think of a real traditional Luddite question for you. And it, it triggers on what, you, what you, you pointed to, which is the MSNBC versus Fox echo chambers. Each of us here is probably living within one of those echo chambers. I do make as much of an effort as I can to watch Fox periodically, to see what the other side is doing. Last year, the FCC put the final nail in the coffin of the fairness doctrine. My question for you is, was the FCC and the government premature in abandoning the fairness doctrine? There seems to be some compulsion for us. Uh, the only time we ever see both sides side by side in a fair hearing is presumably in the debate format. Should there be a compulsion through the fairness doctrine to compel Fox and MSNBC to periodically represent the other point of view so we're not just lost in our own echo chambers? Yeah, the, the problem is, is you just can't. I mean, you know, I don't know whether Fox um, uh, was responding to the fairness um, uh, doctrine in their first few years, but what they used to do was almost worse than what they do now, which was they find some really smart, uh, telegenic Republican who knew all the issues and the best arguments, and some moron Democrat <laughs> who I'd never heard of. And like, they'd say Democratic strategies, and I'd say, prove it. Like, for who? For what? <laughs> and you'd ask them, and they'd say, well, I voted Democratic, and Fox lets me on. So, uh, and I think what they found that their market research showed that their audience didn't even like that. They, didn't, they would much rather see Republicans and conservatives beating up on Democrats than having a Democrat, in, a live Democrat, being beaten to the pulp. Uh, and the same is, you know, on, on the same, the same dynamic, at, I think, at MSNBC, which is, you know, I, I turned on the debate coverage, the aftermath, and I was just flipping around. I went to MSNBC. They had five people on the table. All of them were hosts of the show. All of them were hosts for shows because they're liberals, and they thought Obama won. Surprise! <laughs> uh, but you can't. I mean, we don't. The, I think the. I mean, again, you know more about this than I do from the, but the, 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 the reason for the, the law was written in a time where there was this very um, uniform media landscape of, well, you've got these three networks and you've got this, and it made sense then. I, I just don't know how you enforce it, and I, there's, I, I think, law, the only thing worse than, you know, having no law or a bad law is a law you can't enforce. Because then you have half the people trying to live within the law, losing to people who know, well, I'm going to just violate the law because there's something they can do about it. And that's that's even worse than... Well, it breeds cynicism and distrust. Yeah. That's a bad thing. Yeah. And so I, I, I think the the, re, the reality, and again, it's this is I mean, this is one of those ones that transcends the Democrat Republican, you know, orthodoxy, which is the market is really going to have come up with a solution. And even as a Democrat, there's not a lot the government can do. Uh, I mean, the, there's not nothing the government can do. The, the first debate, I thought, raised a really important issue, which is, you know, if you have a landscape where, um, you know, uh, there, there is no quality, you know, what's wrong with spending a little bit of money to make sure that you have quality news and culture? You know, uh, with, with PBS and the, the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. So I don't think the government is absent from this debate, uh, but I don't I don't know how you could enforce a law or write a law that would would um, enforce fairness. Um, you know, again, you know, unless we get to a point where we we do public financing, and then equal time is determined by you know we have a you know like a British uh, election system where you just they get five minutes for free, they can do whatever they want, they can you know, stand there and read the phone book. In our system, I uh, just don't see how it works. So, what an incredible uh, session. And first, I want to thank uh, everybody who attended. When I see events like this, like the Constitution Day program, the Professor Gora program, to me, this represents the best of Brooklyn Law School. Uh, you've come, you've engaged, you've participated, and, uh, you know, it truly is a scholars and practitioners and students uh, eager to learn about uh, important leading issues that affect the law in our society. So 
first, I compliment all of you for um, making this law school a great institution that it is. Um, a couple of housekeeping tips. If you like this session, um, Monday, we have another debate watch uh, in uh, 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 Geraldo's. Yeah, he, had, he had graduated from this law school. <laughs> In fact, this cafe is extremely popular. Uh, he didn't endow the library, he endowed the cafe. And, uh, <laughs> so Monday night, now, I, I think it's 9 o'clock, but pay attention to the notices because I saw some notice about a different time, but I, I assume that the, the actual debate starts at 9 o'clock. Uh, and then if uh, next week, in the Moot Courtroom, we have an extraordinary program where one of the leading uh, appellate advocates in the country, David Frederick, former Deputy Solicitor General under President Clinton, uh, will be practicing a, for a real Supreme Court argument in the case of Amgen versus um, the Connecticut uh, Retirement System. And that is Thursday or Friday? When is that? Thursday, Thursday at 4 p.m. here. And the magic words for student participation, there will be a reception afterwards. <laughs> So stay tuned for that. And to Joe, I, I just uh, toured a force, and I, I can genuinely, genuinely say to you, as the new dean here, uh, that this is the best media society program I've participated in. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really, really very grateful. We went above the line.